Okay, so you're a new architect on a new project. Congratulations. And let's say that this new project is where you will do some kind of discovery with clients. You will need to figure out what the client needs to, to do, what needs to be done on our side, decide how to do it. And usually, of course, you are time constrained when you're doing the discovery. You have to collect as much information as possible in, in a small amount of time. Or another situation, you're, for example, onboarding on a new project, but it's not one of these fancy projects where you have onboarding guides, uh, introductory documentation, or searchable, well-maintained, comprehensive wiki. No, it's not one of these projects, but still they expect you to onboard quickly and start producing value quickly. So uh, in any case, there will be one stuff that will be coming your way like, like a water from fire hose. This stuff is data and information. And there will be never a shortage of that data or information for for a uh, for an architect on a project. And uh, in this talk, I will share some some experience about what works for me and what tool work for, works for me of managing this fire hose of data and information on a project. But first of all, I said data and information. What is it exactly? So there's uh, this model which is called data information knowledge wisdom which kind of describes these things. Uh, so let's talk about it. So in the architect perspective, what are these things? Well, first of all, data. Data is some kind of objective factor observation, which is not organized and not processed. It does not have, it lacks context or interpretation. So if you have an analogy with a traveler, uh, you have like a, just a printout of all the list of street names or coordinates of all the buildings or a phone book. It, it's hard to extract any value out of this. And from the architect's point of view, when the architect is joining a project or starting a discovery, the equivalent of data is small notes or excerpts of uh, some kind of chats or conversations or some assorted links or names of stakeholders you need to talk about. It's data, it's not structure. But there is also information. Uh, so information is data that has been organized in some way to be meaningful and useful and pro pro uh, provide context. And in the analogy of the traveler, it's like a pile of booklets on the hotel reception. So every booklet kind of makes sense on, on its own, but it's just a pile of these things. You, it's hard to, 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 to create a big picture out of that. And if we empathize with our new architect, it's like uh, having a load of separate documents in, in some shared folder somewhere or wiki pages or emails or transcripts of meetings or notes. Um, that is information. So what is this knowledge? Actually, the central topic of our talk today and knowledge is... Um, Knowledge is information that provides an understanding uh, of the different meanings and on different levels and from different angles, uh, including the intent behind the described things. So uh, in the um, analogy of the traveler, it's like a city map with a city guide section. Uh, it's knowledge because uh, it provides you with a top-down view where you can drill down in any direction that you want if you need it. And Basically, whether you know it or not, uh, your first task as a new architect on a project is to essentially map this knowledge that is hiding in the sea of data and information. And like I said, very often, there is no shortage of data and information on the project. There will always be this file dumpster or, or you know, wiki uh, pile of, of pages, but there will be not always uh, a good repository of knowledge um, on the project. And like I said, it will most likely be one of your first tasks uh, on the project is to build some kind of map of this knowledge, at least for yourself. Uh, a note about wisdom. So um, basically when, the, when, when I'm saying that you need to build the map of knowledge, you can ask why. 
And essentially, that is to produce wisdom. And it's a pretentious name. I don't particularly like it, but that's what this pyramid model calls it. Device a specific action in pursuit of a specific goal. Because of course you're you're the architect on the project, not 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 to to just read things and, and collect things. But you need to produce some kind of insight or some kind of recommendation or basically some kind of call for action, which is going to be an architecture vision document uh, or some kind of architectural decisions or implementation plan. But basically, it's going to be your recommendations about what the future is going to be. And in the in the vacation traveler view, it's like uh, having a four day vacation plan in the city. Uh, and in the architects, you like I said, it's the archite architectural documentation and architectural decisions you are going to make. To make, and basically that's wisdom. The problem is that wisdom builds on knowledge, which is often missing in in a project. So, mm, when do you know that you have knowledge? Uh, you know that you have knowledge when you can talk and reason about the project from different angles and on multiple levels. For example, the business angle can be who the client is and why we are building this. Project organization, organization angle is the stakeholder map, and the technical angle is like uh, solution architecture, application architecture, operational operations level, and um, this illustrates that it is pretty much impossible to know everything that it, there is to know about the project. And from the get go, you need to select the angle that is most important for you. For example, on the discovery, the business angle is exceptionally important. You need to understand your stakeholder, your the business model of the of the client. But when you are onboarding a project that already running, the, the technical angle will be the, the higher priority. So you decide what, what kind of angle in the, the knowledge you are creating for yourself is the most important. And of course, these angles are just uh, examples. Uh, the list of, of, uh, of them will strongly depend on your role and, and your task and the nature of the project. And you know that you have knowledge if you can if you can make connections between these angles and these levels. That's that's when you know that you that you understand the project. For example, you can say that we need a digital twin platform, which is a technical decision, because the client in some point of future will want to add unpredictable types of devices to the to the system. This is a business level. You connected these dots, you understand the project, and uh, you have the knowledge about it. Okay, so what is the correct way of, of producing knowledge out of information? Of course, there's no correct way. Uh, again, I'm telling you about what works for me, uh, but please treat this as a source of ideas for your own workflow, uh, not as something prescriptive or some, some methodology that has to be followed. Okay, but let's get, let's get back from philosophy to practice. And our scenario is that uh, you need to ingest a lot of information. It can be discovery inputs produced by your clients or project information you ingest when you're onboarding. And from uh, from my experience, what what you what really works, uh, what you, what you might want to do is a rapid response knowledge base, uh, personal uh, rapid response knowledge base. So uh, why rapid response? Because you don't have a lot of time. You, of course, can uh, be tempted to sit down and structure all, all the information that's been dumped onto you, but typically you don't have a lot of time for that. During project onboarding, you want to start bringing value as soon as possible. On a discovery, again, you have like one or two weeks where you have to do everything. And why personal? Uh, from my experience, um, you need to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put on your neighbors. Uh, before you can start helping other people, you you become you need to become uh, an expert yourself quickly and again you can't know everything uh, you have to select an angle which will be most important uh, for you on this particular project this assignment which means that some information is going to be important to look at and some is not going to be important which is for sure something that different people will not agree with you on because for, for business analysts, for example, information will be important that is maybe less important to you and vice versa. 
So first of all, you have to prioritize yourself and you have to become an expert quickly before you can guide others and help others. And of course, you can publish later because your personal knowledge base can relatively easily be converted into some kind of public resource if you want. Okay, so now let's uh, let's see how uh, Obsidian can help us with this. And Obsidian is a, um, a tool that I think is uh, close to ideal to this creation of these rapid response pers personal knowledge bases. So Obsidian is, um, on one hand, it's complex because it's like IDE for text. So of course, you know, IDE is like uh, uh, Visual Studio Code or, or PyCharm. Um, so this is the same thing, but for text and notes. It's like um, a whole uh, integrated environment for that. But on the other hand, Obsidian is simple. So uh, an Obsidian Vault is just a collection of markdown notes. And it does not care at all what's in these notes or how you organize them. It gives you a lot of ways to do it. But for, for Obsidian, it's just text and pictures and files. So this combination of uh, powerful features and uh, conceptual simplicity of markdown files is what, uh, from my perspective, makes it a powerful tool for taming this uh, torrent of data in information. So a few facts, uh, a few facts about Obsidian. So Obsidian works on a local directory of files. Um, since GDPR, when you want to use some kind of tool on a project, if it's a cloud-based tool, essentially it's showstopper because you need to negotiate GDPR stuff. You need to uh, you need to create a data sharing agreement with the vendor of the tool, and nobody has time to to arrange that. So essentially, you're stopped uh, in your tracks. Obsidian works on local files, uh, so um, it mitigates GDPR issues and, of course, risk of leaks uh, or stuff like that. But um, side note, it is very well suited for Git. Obsidian has multiple means to structure information or search for the information in the store. There are dozens of plugins like VS Code extensions. It is very queryable and programmable for advanced use cases. Uh, so there's a plugin called Data View where you can basically write scripts that render uh, text uh, on the fly according to some logic or query that you, you provide. And uh, Obsidian vaults or these folders where markdown files are stored, they are fully portable. So all settings and plugins uh, are in the vault directory. So if you just send the vault as an archive, or if you just uh, put it into a Git repository, all the settings, all the configuration, and all the plugins will be just available by magic to everybody who opens the vault. You don't have to install anything, you just open. Uh, it is not free for commercial, for commercial usage, but it is not expensive. It's uh, $50 per year of price. Um, very brief introduction into the, the main parts of Obsidian, but uh, the good part is that it looks like an IDE, so you will be able to figure it out quickly. So it has a file manager where you can see the, the, the nodes that you have uh, accumulated. You can create a new node. Uh, you can, if you want, you can, for example, paste some kind of a picture. You can paste the picture right into, into the vault, which make uh, which becomes available here uh, or in any directory you specify. You can, of course, make formatting of the text. You can make it bold. You can insert code. You can insert the same picture again if you want. Um, so it supports directories. So you can organize uh, your nodes in, the, in directory structure, which is not the, base way, uh, the best way to do it, but you can do it. Um, there are, of course, links. So there is a wiki link where you can uh, link to any other page in your vault. Um, if you wish, you can rename a page that you have created, and uh, the links will be updated in, in all the other places. Um, there is the support of tags. Uh, which work pretty much as you expect. Uh, there's also features like outline where you can see all the headings of the document you're working on. There are tabs and panes which allow you to drag different things from, from, one, from one place to another. There is a very cool feature called canvas 
which is essentially a diagram tool embedded into into the program where you can use as uh, as cards uh, text or notes or anything else you can connect them with arrows as you wish there are themes and uh, to visual to, uh, to style the program and of course there are extensions like I mentioned okay so that was a very quick tour of the obsidian program but now let's get back to our situation where you are you an, a new um, architect that uh, is bombarded with different information pieces? And essentially, you're in a situation where somebody sent you a useful link or sent you a password for a Miro board, or you have a bright idea that you want to remember, or you've been assigned an action item on a meeting, or you came across some abbreviation that you want to remember. So now that you have this, what do you do with this? So typically, you know, the, the documentation stack that is available to us is not very conducive to uh, these kinds of information and data because you have to think about where you put this information. Okay, so you need to decide on a specific program or web page, depending on what you want to say. Um, maybe it's Confluence, you have a Confluence, but it's not enough for a separate Confluence page. So you, you don't want to store a mirror password in a Confluence page. Uh, you need to, if, if you're sure that there's a Confluence page for that, you need to know how to find it. Um, but maybe it's not public information, you just want to store it privately. So maybe it's SharePoint, but you just shudder in the thought of opening a SharePoint uh, dumpster. Uh, maybe some local Word document, but in what directory you want to store this information. So for example, um, this is information about the optimization of some component in your project called Valera. So should you put this in the folder called optimization or should you put it in the folder called Valera? Um, difficult choice. Um, maybe you have a personal mirror board. So myriad of choices and in the end, uh, when you're faced with this, you typically say, screw it. I hope to just remember it sometime. I hope to find it sometime. And it it, it gets lost. It, it's not used in the big picture of, of the uh, knowledge that you want to build. And you have essentially become the victim of information capturing friction. So the process of information capturing is so unpleasant that you tend to lose information. You lose this password. You cannot find it. You go to your colleague again. They hate you for, for this. So um, how can Obsidian uh, help with frictionless capturing? Well, um, if you, for example, came across some kind of uh, information that you want to preserve, like we have this wiki, wiki page about this model that you for some reason want to keep, you can just copy this information. I'm now pressing a key, uh, key, key combination on my keyboard and you uh, immediately brought to uh, Obsidian where you can just paste this, this uh, bit of information. And for sure you can name it if you want like this. So you have um, captured this information. Um, and by the way, you don't need to save though. So essentially it's, it's already there. Uh, if you change it, it auto saves all the changes. Um, this is, um, uh, this is the way uh, Obsidian can help you with capturing the information. But um, you can uh, ask how does it work? What is the structure? What do you do later with this? And essentially, um, this method of um, storing your knowledge as uh, a collection of individual and interlinked nodes is called the settle custom method. You can uh, read up on it, but basically it says that your knowledge base consists of many individual nodes, and there is no expectation or whatsoever on what a node is. There is no constraints. A node can, can be small or big. It can be absolutely anything. It can be a meeting agenda. It can be a thought, a link, an email draft. It can be like I showed you an excerpt from a web page, or it can be a document. Uh, so you don't have to think about storing information. It's just there. And also the node files files in this method do not have any directory structure. You can just dump those nodes uh, in, in the vault in the root directory. And according to this method, it's fine because structure is achieved by other means. But everything is in the same directory. You don't have to think about it. 
Um, you can ask, but how do I find things? How do I navigate this just big dump of, of uh, markdown files? So we'll talk about it later. But for now, um, the, the takeaway is that uh, what this method provides you of frictionless cap uh, uh, capturing is this information capturing is decoupled from information structuring. You don't have to, to think about the structure of your information before you capture it. Uh, which is very uh, important if you need to capture some information quickly while you have it, like during discovery session or when somebody has just came up to you to talk about something. You can worry about structure later after you capture stuff. And removing friction from information capturing prevents you from missing or losing information. Okay, the burning question is how is it usable without a structure? And of course, uh, there will be structure, uh, for sure. But let us ask our, us uh, the question about what structure do we want to have uh, our personal knowledge base of uh, of our project. First of all, I'm convinced that you do want uh, hierarchies in your structure. And, well, you can say that hierarchies are old school. Nobody works with hierarchies. Everybody works with, you know, high horizontal interlinked stuff. The problem is that human working memory is limited and you will never be able to truly understand a huge sprawling linear system uh, because it just will not fit in, in your head. Your working memory can jug juggle like a dozen of items at the same time. It cannot juggle like 70 items or 1000 items. And if your task is to make connections between different levels, like the business level or some kind of technical level, um, if you don't fit these levels in your head, you will be struggling to make the connections. So you do need to separate the complexity into levels and um, levels with sub-levels is hierarchy. But then when, you, when we are talking about hierarchy, let's go back to Valera and optimization. If we want to store a note about optimization of the component name Valera, which folder is it? So the answer is both folders, or maybe not folders, but um, your uh, hierarchy must be non-exclusive. If you want to put something into more than one place, you need to be able to do it. So um, in this case, uh, if you want to, to capture something about optimization of Valera, you put it into two places, optimization and Valera. So you can find it in both places if you wish. And moreover, your knowledge, as I mentioned, can have multiple uh, routes connected to multiple angles. So you can have a, a, a page about stakeholder map or project structure, which will be separate from the page for, about the architecture of your project, which means that you can have it in both places uh, freely if your hierarchy is uh, non-exclusive and allows things to be in many places at once. And also you want fluid structure. You um, will never arrive at the right knowledge structure up front. So you, you must have a system that lets uh, you restructure your knowledge base very easily. Uh, you will start out with something very simple. And as you go, uh, you will find better and better structure if you're not lazy about refactoring of structure from time to time. And this way, a good knowledge map will just emerge gradually from, from your work, as opposed to having analysis paralysis about thinking about your structure up front. So how can Obsidian help you with the structuring of uh, So there are, like I said, multiple tools, multiple facilities in Obsidian. So um, facility number one is, um, is tags. Uh, like like I said, you can assign tags to to multiple nodes if you wish. For example, you can assign the tag formatting to to a few of pages about formatting. This is just a sandbox uh, for illustration. And in in the tags, um, you'll be able to see all the pages that have this uh, this tag. And for sure, the tag can be there can be multiple tags per per page. Uh, and tags themselves are uh, hierarchical. So you can, for example, make a tag that uh, looks like this. 
And in your hierarchy of tags, you will be able to see this information in a hierarchical way. Another facility is uh, metadata of nodes. And properties. To, to your to your nodes you create. Uh, for example, you can make a property called um, access level, and you can make access level private, uh, or you can use some other way to structure. Um, Obsidian lets you have metadata on individual files, and of course, you can uh, see all the properties of all the pages that you have created. Um, on the level of the vault. And uh, lastly, another approach to, to create structure in, in your nodes is, uh, is to create an index node. It's not because it combines the, the benefits of, uh, of many uh, structure. So, uh, the benefit of it is this, is uh, you can add formatting, you can add comments to your tree structure, you can um, basically write things in it, uh, and I will show you a way to use index notes uh, in a demo uh, slightly after this, uh, after you finish with uh, this presentation. I think the sharing dropped with the connection, so we are I, at least I don't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right now. So I I apologize. I am on four G. Okay, you should be you seeing the screen. Turning your yes, video yes. off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will try. I will uh, turn my video feed off and, uh, and ask you to turn your video off as well to make sure we don't have dropouts. Cool. So. Um, let me show you how, uh, on a practical example, uh, these things can help you onboard uh, quickly um, if you have to grow a new architecture. Uh, so the, the setup is as follows. Imagine you're a new architect uh, onboarding on a project which is about small factories building some kind of product and here's what you're told you're told that the manufacturing is a slow process and when the product is manufactured its weight uh, on a scale and it's photographed and this information is stored on the cloud and this factory is managed by some kind of application called operation uh, operator app from which this uh, weighing photographing process is initiated and they say that it's just a small part of the whole solution there's no documentation about the whole solution, unfortunately. There's only assorted documents about bits and pieces, um, about certain components of this solution. But your job as an architect is to figure out and document the solution architecture as a whole. Uh, so you need to assemble the big picture from, from bits and pieces that, that are floating around in Confluence, for example, or in some kind of uh, directories uh, with shared files. Um, but they give you a hint. You can start figuring this out from the weighing application, the, the application that pertains to weighing and, and uh, photographing this, uh, this product, because it has a document about it which is pretty comprehensive, and it, it refers to other pieces of the solution architecture that you need to, doc to understand and document. Um, and I am telling you the, all of this without showing all of this, because that's typically how it works on a project. Somebody talks to you about things, but it's not always uh, the case that they can actually sh uh, uh, present uh, information already for your consumption. So just uh, try to remember what I'm saying. And you open this document about this weighing application. And it's, it's not very small. It has a lot of stuff in it, and well, and you also know that it's one of 
50 documents that you need to parse before you can before you can assemble the information about uh, the knowledge about the, the big architecture. So what do you do? Uh, what do you do now? Um, and you understand that you're you you are pressed with with time constraints. So the first step for you is to understand the angle of the knowledge you have to quickly build for yourself. And in this case, uh, you will need some kind of diagram of the solution architecture, right? Uh, and architectures are usually full of details, uh, but for now you don't have time for details. You need to figure out the basic uh, ingredients of this uh, solution, their basic interfaces, uh, their basic relations, their basic uh, capabilities, um, essentially what is inside and what contains what and what talks to what, right? And uh, preferably you also understand the simplest scenarios involving this, these components. Uh, if you talk to each other, then why do they do this? Uh, after you assemble this picture, you can dive deep. But for now, uh, you decide that you treat this unknown architecture as basically as a connection of boxes and arrows, where each box is a component or a service or some kind of hardware thing in case of IoT projects like this one that does something. You don't even know what it is. Uh, but each box in, in your mental model has some kind of, necessarily has some kind of interface through which other boxes can talk to it. And boxes are linked together by, by some communications, right? So you have extremely simple uh, model of, of this architecture from which you can start building the, the deeper understanding. And now let's see how Obsidian can help you with uh, building it quickly and structuring it quickly. So you are starting to read this document and you see that it is planned to install a new camera. And of course it says it is planned, but it's an outdated document because it's already installed. So there's a new camera in the factory, which is mounted under the ceiling. So immediately the camera will be something that your architecture diagram will contain. So you just add a link uh, to a document, which is called box slash camera which means that it will reside in the directory called box and it will have the name of camera. And you can uh, enter links that do not exist yet. And, and that's fine, that's a feature. Um, okay, so you know that you will have a camera. Um, maybe let's create it. You just go in there and it uh, springs into existence in the correct directory, in the directory box with the name camera. But you don't write anything. You just need to remember that camera is a thing in this architecture. OK, in the factory, which is mounted under the ceiling above the scale, to take a picture during uh, weighing actions. When the weighing process is done, the taken picture and the corresponding data points shall be uploaded to an appropriate AWS S3 bucket or piped into the corresponding data pipeline. OK, a lot of information here. So first of all, there is a scenario described. This scenario is about taking a picture and uploading it to S3 bucket. And scenarios are very important because when you model in your head a scenario that happens in, in some kind of a system, you typically uncover a lot of information and a lot of gaps in your understanding. So it's important to capture scenarios as well. Uh, so that's what you do. You just create uh, a folder called scenario which you, uh, and the scenario you want to track is um, picture taken. And again, it's just, for now, it's a small, it's an, an empty note. And you intentionally don't write anything in there, but you might ask why, why is it useful to have empty notes linked from here? So the usefulness is in the backlinks. Even if you don't have any information in the note that you have just created, you can always uh, see where this note is linked from. So every time you want to, for example, see where the picture you're taking scenario is referenced, you can uh, jump to this place uh, in, the, in this huge document and just take a look at it. Later on, if you have time, you can, in this uh, scenario note that you have created, you can make a summary for yourself or you can make some, uh, some, uh, um, some reference information. But for now, the fact that it's empty, it's for you, it's, uh, it's okay. Because the information is in the placement of those links rather than in information, in, uh, uh, the information contains, uh, contained in the note. 
Okay, so again, you, you see that there's an S3 bucket. And again, this S3 bucket is going to be a box on your diagram. So you say box or photos. Just care about the name. You can easily change the name later when you understand it better. But for now, it's just this. Um, cool. So let's move on, and we have more information about this camera. Okay. Um, so going back a little bit, we encountered a section about this camera that we are tracking. So we inserted a link to the camera again. It's fine to, of course, have links from different places. We can, we can see that there are two places the camera is referenced. Uh, and we can see that this camera has an integrated REST API. So you immediately pause because as an architect, you know that interfaces are really important. And you want to capture uh, the fact that it has an interface. So what you do is just create a subfolder for this camera called interface uh, uh, REST API. And by magic, it already is tracked as a REST API, um, which again, you can um, take a look at later. If you wish for, for completeness, you can add as separate nodes all the methods here that uh, are important for you. But, but for the sake of time, I will not do this. And let us do a little, uh, a, a few more things. Interface is not the only thing that you are cared about. Uh, as an architect, you also care about the situations where different boxes talk to each other, uh, the different situations by, where they are linked to each other in some way. So, but how to capture the fact that some component talks to another component? Um, like, for example, Uh, you see that this camera from the cloud is controllable by the operator app. So that's the sentence that you come across and you don't completely understand what it means. You barely know anything, but you already see that there's a link between the uh, camera and this operator app. So first of all, you, you track this operator app as a box that you want to add later to your diagram. There it is. And you can add uh, a, spe a special note, which is, for example, can be placed in the folder link, uh, which says that operator app is links in some way to the camera. That's all you know. But you will not forget about this link when you are uh, drawing your diagram or when you are finally thinking about this architecture. And okay, so we can see that this um, describes the scenario of uploading camera snapshots here. So I think it's a good idea to uh, to refer to this uh, scenario of picture taking in this place. Okay, so what we can see is this um, operator application also has some API, which is triggered from something called node red flow. Not sure what this is, but we don't need to understand what this, what this is. We can track this as a box on our diagram. Node red flow. Okay. Um, and we can see that there is communication between the operator app and the node red flow. Okay, so there's a link between these things. We create it so we don't forget about it. And Okay, so this communication is realized by using MQTT messages. Okay, cool. So we can already see that uh, this link is via MQTT protocol. You can put this immediately in the notes. 
And we can see that the camera, this uh, operator app has this endpoint, which looks like it's a REST endpoint by the look of it. So you create this interface. You have the box called operator app. This is just decoration and you add REST interface. Okay, there you have it. And um, you don't, like I said, it can stay empty for now. The information is in the location of this link here. Uh, okay, uh, so this looks like an what an MQTT topic, right? So let's track MQTT topics as well. So MQTT topic, uh, let's call it cameras. It's It looks like an environment because it's dev or prod and it looks like camera ID. So we just name it like this to track it. So as you go down, essentially, what you are doing is you are annotating what you see according to the needs you have. And um, the good, the nice thing about this approach is that since you are careful about how you are naming your notes here that you create on the fly, essentially what you have at the end is already the structure of your knowledge. Because if you see, uh, if you expand those uh, folders that you have created with the notes inside them, it's already like a reference of this uh, architecture that is taking shape. You are not thinking about it. You are just naming notes as you go. But the structure emerges organically. It, it's like something that you are building without thinking about it too much. And for sure, if you know that uh, this S3 bucket that we created here, has a specific name assigned to it. Like it can be called um, Valera in your project. You rename it and the rename is uh, actualized everywhere. If you understand that this is not a box, but something else, you can move it to another bucket and the structure will update uh, itself accordingly, again, automatically. But you can ask that uh, you did not recommend to use directory structure for uh, for making your notes. And by default, that's, that's what I recommend. But sometimes it is uh, good to uh, use directory structure just to make sure that the uh, names of the notes that you are creating are not duplicate. Uh, so next step, once you are finished uh, parsing this document and, create, and creating these notes, which I will not do because we don't have a lot of time, uh, you can build this uh, index note that I have uh, alluded to at the beginning. So by uh, you can do it by, so this index node will be the, the knowledge map essentially that you're creating because those directories and notes in themselves are not uh, the knowledge. They are just um, the means to store the notes. So right now you want to um, make a structure out of these things. So you can see, for example, everything that you have created. This is a simple script that shows all the notes that are created in the vault, but are not indexed from this, uh, from this node, which is a showcase of this uh, ability of Obsidian to be programmed, to be, to be um, uh, scripted. It's essentially just a, a simple JavaScript that you can write in line, or you can store it in, inside a file. But the gist of it is that it has all the nodes that you have created that are not linked from the index, which is a good reference for you because you want to build uh, to, to make sure you don't forget anything. So you, you start doing this. So you start from boxes. And what boxes do you have? You have camera. 
you have a uh, node red flow, you don't know what it is, you just put it here for now. You have the Valera bucket, you have uh, the operator application. Uh, and you have a scenario that you want to, to track, which is picture taking. It's not the only scenario that that you want do, that you will want to track, but it's the only one you know about. Um, and now you can you can see how things link, uh, and of course the links that you have uh, in, in identified. It's like this one. And sorry, this one. The REST API is the REST, uh, REST API of the camera. So, okay, you can say that it has an interface. And the interface is camera's REST API. Again, if I didn't use folders, this REST API could be a duplicate with some other component, which also has REST API. So you can use folders if you need to, but the information about the structure is not in the folders, it's in this index node. And also there is a REST interface of the operator, operator application, which for some reason I type slightly differently. There you go. And okay, so what you have is an MQTT topic. MQTT is a protocol used in the Internet of Things, and it can distribute data according to two topics. And yeah, you now have you can now maintain a list of all the MQTT topics used uh, used throughout the solution. And just to illustrate that the structure is above the. Uh, um, Sorry, losing track of my thoughts. Um, one of the things that you discover later is that the uh, way the weighing um, the camera is connected uh, to this industrial PC, and its firmware is running in this industrial PC. I am not showing you how it you find it in this document because we are pressed in time. But imagine that you know this now, right? So you can add the box industrial PC. And in this index, you can um, uh, you can specify that, of course, it exists. But um, You are free to now uh, model your structure as the camera is connected to this industrial PC, right? So this is exactly the case where you can have one entity showing up in different places, uh, which is okay because these are different contexts. So when you are thinking about this industrial PC, you can say that the cam you can see that the camera is connected to this PC uh, to this PC, but also you. you are free to have this camera as a completely separate node of the hierarchy that, that you are modeling. Uh, and if you want to see all the places it shows up in the hierarchy, since this index node is just a node, when you go to the camera, um, uh, camera node, you can see every place in the index that it show up, uh, shows up in. So it allows you to reason about the place it is connected to or the logical structure of the application it takes part in, uh, which is why it is important that uh, you model your uh, your knowledge uh, in an index node or uh, in a series of tags, but not in a folder structure like this. Okay, I really ran through this. Um, I um, for sure it would take longer for you to complete the whole document and build the whole the whole knowledge map, but I hope that the approach is clear from this, and uh, we still have I think seven minutes for Q and A, so I will pause uh, and wait for your questions. Uh, yeah, Yaroslav, we have uh, some question in the chat. If you can take mm -hmm. it, please. Starts from second, maybe. 
Uh, why it doesn't? So let's see. No, not this. <laughs> ah, is Obsidian offline version of Quip? I'm I'm not, uh, to be honest, uh, aware of Quip. But it is there is a a, a great um, a huge number of uh, tools like this. So it may be that so something looks like Obsidian. Obsidian, the differentiator of Obsidian among other tools is uh, the sheer size of the ecosystem of plugins. It has many hundreds of plugins, which can you essentially customize this tool as, as you want to. to uh... So this is why I chose Obsidian, but it's not, you know, uh, I'm not endorsing it commercially. So you are feel, uh, feel free to use uh, tools uh, that suit, suit you better. Why not mention operator app in the camera node, create, create a link between them? Uh, you can use, uh, if you wish, you can create a link between them. But uh, the problem with creating uh, this link is that it is uh, information that is slightly redundant. So you store the information. Um, let me illustrate with, let me share the screen. And to show uh, show what I mean. So to phrase your question slightly differently, why not, for example, mention that camera is um, uh, firmware uh, software is ran in industrial PC. It is useful to have this information, right? And you can have it, but the problem is that you can already infer this information uh, even if you uh, don't have it here because you can always go to the index um, node which contains the information about the relations of your node and you can readily see that it is connected to industrial pc therefore making this information duplic uh, duplicating this information in the node itself is not very useful because it's uh, extra work but more importantly because if you change this somehow you are likely to forget about this relation that it also uh, also lives here. Therefore, it's best to have the relation information captured in this uh, master index node rather, rather than in the nodes themselves. But as you research, as you are encountering the camera in this huge document here. Hey, it's uh, Michal, I, I actually asked the question, so yes. I, uh -huh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh agree with you on that because if you would go on the view for uh, a graph mm -hmm. you can see directly on the graph each link and yes. uh, anything that you put in index it, it is just a link between different uh, things to the index yes. and basically everything will be indexed to the uh, ref uh, referenced by index mm -hmm. so you don't really know the relations between the two things that you're mentioning in index you just know that they're both of them are mentioned in index uh, that's why ah, I would argue okay okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you, because if you yes. just show, maybe you should just show this uh, graph view because then agree, you would see on a graph view that you, you, you can't really see that there is a relation between the two objects. Yes, uh, you are right. I uh, agree with you because I misinterpreted your question. In the link, it is really useful to have these things mentioned because for sure, when you are looking where the operator app is mentioned, you can see that it's in this link and, and you can uh, yeah i just asked it because i in, instead of creating a link node i would probably just send, uh, create a note uh, mention one thing in, in one node to the other and then the link would be handled by obsidian itself uh, mm -hmm. without like adding note of the link unless you really want to describe the link in some specific way it's uh, a perfectly valid approach yes like i said it's not a methodology it's just ideas that you can take and shape up your own approach if you wish yeah, sure, it, sure. it will work it will work yeah uh, it will definitely work and what i want to mention is this is intermediate representation of this information i do not uh, recommend to maintain this structure long term because as soon as you have this diagram or as soon as you have the series of diagrams as soon as you have created this solution architecture documentation from all of these things mentioned here, 
it is typically a good idea to keep maintaining this, these diagrams and these uh, and this and these documents, uh, and not this intermediate representation that just lets you create some kind of interim map of where things are and who talks to to what before you set out to actually create this this big uh, solution diagram uh, that your project management manager asked you to do. Okay, I think that's all the time we have, uh, right, Aliona?